Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Last week, we discussed a little bit about how to pray, how not to pray. And the conclusion was, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. It's not just the prayer, the life itself. If you're away from the word of God, that's an abomination. And it continues with today's passage about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, think about it. It's not the Lord's Prayer. I mean, you can't be misleading. It's not the prayer that He prayed. He taught us how to pray. So this is supposed to be the believer's prayer. I don't think He asked God to forgive His sins. Jesus Himself has no sin. So this is for us. And verse 9 starts with this. Pray then like this, Christians, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So, our Father is the key point. Joshua prayed about it. Some people are confused with this word. In Greek language, original language, it's a pater. That's the one that on the left. And a lot of people think, okay, how about Abba, the one on the right? So, you must heard the Abba, Father, in an expression. To give you some background, Back in the old days, in the first century, they were using Aramaic in conversational, colloquial language. They're writing through the Greek. So Abba must have been the one part of their language. But in this particular passage, it talks about pater, which is father. Romans chapter 8 says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's who we are as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So when people see that word, Abba, a lot of times people think this way. At one time, it was thought that since children use this term to address their fathers, the nearest equivalent would be the English term, Daddy. A lot of people teach that way too. Abba, Father, Abba means Daddy. Right? In Korean, we say, Abba. More recently, however, it has been pointed out that Abba was a term not only that small children used to address their fathers, it was also a term that older children and adults used. So this dictionary that I'm referring to, the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, has some authority in the theological world. So it says this, as a result, it is the best to understand Abba as the equivalent of father rather than daddy. You cannot just say, it's daddy. It means daddy. It's too simplistic. You have to have some kind of respect there as father. The way I see it is this. It doesn't matter how you address your father. You can call him daddy. You can call him father. But if you are close to your father in terms of having conversation all the time, having a really good time together, then you can call him father and can still be close to each other. You can call him daddy, always opposing him, always being in an argument. It doesn't really matter what, how you call him. So think of it that way. It's not about the specific terms. It's about the relationship between God and us. So Romans chapter 8 says a similar thing. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God meaning children of God. And it continues. Third bullet point, let's read that together. Ready? Go. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with them in order that we may also be glorified with them. Being children of God does not mean your life will be always okay. You achieve the goals all the time. Everything is fine and dandy. Your relationship always goes well. No. It says, provided we suffer with them in order that we may also be glorified with them. There's some sufferings involved to live as Christians. The thing is, though, we are children of God. The sons of God, children of God, there are some people who can be that way, and they're the ones who can call God our Father. It's not just my father, it's our father. So Martin Louis Jones said this, the men of the world, some people may come to church too, but they don't like this doctrine. What they're saying is this, 
We're all the children of God. How can you exclude anyone? Loving God. God is love. God loves everyone. That is true, but that does not mean everyone is a child of God. And yet, when he prays to God, he has no confidence that he is speaking to his Father. The reason why this type of people saying that we are all the children of God is this. We are all children of God, then I will be included there too. But if somebody says, children of God are supposed to live this way, that way, I'm not one of them. Then I feel bad about it because I don't have any confidence or assurance of salvation. He has no confidence that he is praying or speaking to his father. Strange logic there because he or she does not have confidence. They always say, we're all the children of God. He talks about the fatherhood of God, but he has not received the spirit of adoption. He or she is not a child of God yet. They can talk about it, they have some knowledge, but that's all they have. It is only the one who is in Christ who knows this. So this is only for the people who are spiritually discerning, who can tell fatherhood versus being children of God. It's a privilege that we have. So as believers' prayer, we have to say this, Our Father in heaven, that shows our relationship with God in heaven. That means, simply put, almighty, perfect, and holy God. Some people, when I describe God as the father figure, some people don't like that. Because based on their personal life experience, they don't have a good experience with their father. Then, oh, I don't want God to be my father. We're living in this fallen world. So no father, no mother, no children, no one's perfect. But we're not looking at that relationship. We're looking at what the Bible says about God. It's an almighty, perfect, holy God. So with that, we can say this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He gave us everything already regarding life and godliness. Not a new iPhone, new computer, no, but he gave us everything spiritual. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. It's attainable through the knowledge of God. How do we attain the knowledge of God? Through the word of God, through the Bible. And because we have this personal experience and personal understanding about human relationship, we somehow want to bring that into biblical teachings, which is very dangerous. Think about this. You're exposed to biblical preaching and teaching mostly on Sundays. And rest of the week, you will be working in this world, dealing with a lot of unbelievers. And those things will shape your thoughts and thinking process more. And that's why it's so difficult to change it. I'm going to elaborate more about that later. It says, hallowed be your name. John MacArthur said, God's name represents all that he is. It means his character, plan, and his will. So when you hear, when you read God's name in the Bible in the future, think of God himself. It's not just his name. Your name be glorified. God, you will be glorified by God himself. Proverbs 18 says this, the name of the Lord, that means God himself, is a strong power. The righteous runs into it and is safe. So if you just literally take it, the name of the Lord, you can print the name of the Lord and put it on the wall. You're going to run to that name. That's not what it is. You're running to him because who he is, God himself. How do we do that? Through the word of God. Every week, actually, I repeat this over and over again, the importance of the word of God. And first Peter said this, because he is holy. Like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written. Peter was quoting Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. You shall be holy, for I am holy. You can pray this way, and then I don't live as a Christian. That's not a good idea. Last week's passage, hypocrites do that. They pray things in their words, but their living or life is not supporting what they say. 
But that's not what we're looking for. Actual holiness in our life, in all your behavior, because that's God's command. Right? So if we don't live that way, this is what happens. It's from Romans. Let's read this one together. Already? Go. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. We're Christians, but we don't live like Christians that we're dishonoring God with our lives. And Paul continues saying, For it is written, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You call yourself Israelites, but because of your life, the way you live, you're blaspheming God's name. In today's term, Christians, same thing. Even unbelievers can tell. That person says he's going to church, but he's worse than us. So we have to reflect on those things based on what the Bible says. Am I living the life to glorify the Lord or blaspheming or dishonoring him through my behavior? and action, and my words. And it continues. Your kingdom come. God's kingdom. So if you look at Mark, this is what happened. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What does it mean? We have to repent and believe in the gospel. Without repentance, we cannot get into the kingdom of God. Without repentance, we cannot become Christian, period. So that was the first message, basically, the core message that Jesus preached, and that's the gospel of God. So when we pray about this, your kingdom come, we all have to actually spread the gospel message as well. And it continues, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, another one. We can pray this, we can recite this all the time, but... Luke chapter 4 says this, but he said to them, Jesus is speaking here, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for because I was sent for this purpose. Jesus is God himself, but he came to this earth and saying, this is my mission, guys, spreading the good news of the kingdom of God. So we have to think about this. What's the purpose of my life? If you look at Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, the first chapter, chapter one says, what on earth am I here for? Why am I here? We're not talking about philosophical question about the meaning of life, but biblically speaking, because we know creator created us. He has some plans for us. Then why am I living on this earth right now? Just to make more money, to get promotion, to find a good spouse? That's all good, but those are done by the Gentiles too. Non-believers do the same thing. So if you have the same purpose, same goal, like other people who don't believe in God, that means I don't have anything distinctive as Christian, period. So we have to think about what's the purpose of my life based on what the Bible says. Even in the world though, the secular world teaching basically, motivational teaching, what they're saying is this, you have to have above and beyond this material world to be happy. Even the secular people say that. But the Bible says clearly, biblically speaking, this is more of a spiritual matter. I thought about this in the past week while I was preparing for this sermon. I kind of got the purpose of my life about 12, 11 years ago. I was not young, I was not in my 20s, but I'm thinking that only I can teach this to younger generations so they can realize their goals and purpose in their lives, then they're going to be more motivated. Think about the purpose in your life. You may not have it if you're not motivated at all every single day. You cannot be jumpy all the time, but you are going to be driven by the purpose on this earth. God-given purpose, you have to find it. Everybody's different, but we'll have to find it. Let's not go with a nice job, well-paying job, and money and other things, because you don't have to search for those things. That's the goals for everyone in this world. 
So getting lessons. How many of you got lessons for piano? Yes? That's all we get to. So getting lessons. Why do we get lessons? I like the teacher. No, that's not the point, right? You don't have to like the teacher. But you're trying to learn and improve your skill in that field. Let's say it's a piano. Then you want to learn how to play piano and get better at it. And it's not just for beginners, though. Professionals, the performers, they have coaches and teachers. They always get corrected by their coaches and teachers. Don't do that. You have to change this. Do it this way. Tiger Woods, when he was winning all those tournaments, he still had a coach to perfect his swing and everything. So it never ends. Learning from someone never ends. How does it work? Usually a lot of corrections. When you're learning piano, you want to play like this, but the teacher says, no, that's not how you play. Your hands should be this way. Your fingering should be this way, that way. And you have to learn this unnatural way of initially playing piano. You wanted to play this way naturally, but teacher says that way, which you felt unnatural. But after a while though, that becomes your second nature. You don't even think about it twice, play that way, the right way. Getting lessons is a good thing, but if you only get lesson once a week, you take that piano lesson this week for one hour, and next week you see that teacher again for one hour, between now and then, you never practiced, and you repeat the same process for two months. What happens? Stephen, you know, when you teach somebody, you know they didn't practice. So to achieve the goal, you have to get lesson and practice. That's why you advance to the next level. Then you can teach new things to that student. But if you don't get over that basic stuff, you cannot learn anything difficult. Spiritual maturity comes with a lot of practice. A lot of readings of the Bible, praying, having fellowship with other Christians, a lot of interactions with Father in heaven. You have to have that. To do that, again, you have to go back to the Bible. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read this one together. Ready? Go. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Teaching, that means you're learning. Reproof for correction, for training in righteousness. Any of this, would you like to get that every single day? Getting reproved all the time? Being corrected all the time? No one likes that. But that's how you become a mature Christian. That's how you become a better player in piano. With that training, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So people say we do a lot of good works in the world. Yes, people help each other. That's a good thing. People send money to those people who got this earthquake happened. It happens all the time. That's a good thing, but that's a worldly thing. The motivation for us is being a man of God. We are doing good works based on what the Bible says. You have to be the man of God first. You have to be the children of God first to do good things based on what the Bible says. On the surface, it looks like the same thing that you do. But our motivation is different. It's not about self-promoting, self-glorifying behavior. It's for God's glory, for God's kingdom that I do this. So when things happen, I don't take it personally. Conclusion. Let's read the passage together. Ready? Go. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart and glorify your name forever. The first part, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Your name means God himself. Again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom and knowledge based on the Proverbs. So this one is a prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. If you grant me this understanding, I have a commitment in me. I will walk in your truth if you make me understand what it is. Unite my heart to fear 
your name. God, please give me this heart to fear you, to respect you, to revere you. That's a prayer. Then what happens next is this. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart and will glorify your name forever. I will live like that as Christian. First bullet point and second bullet point, there's a difference. First part is prayer. Second part is the way we're supposed to live. Right? We'll give thanks to God because he's our heavenly father. If you're not sure about your father, then how can you thank him? So you have to know him through the word of God. Oh Lord, my God, with all my heart. And we'll glorify your name forever. So that has to be our purpose in life. Whatever you do, you can be a doctor, a nurse, you can be a musician. It doesn't really matter what you do. Your goal has to be that, to glorify God forever, then you will do fine. And think about this. We come here at the church every week and listen to the sermon, just like getting lesson. So one hour lesson, it's not even. And then after that, Monday through Saturday, you need to practice. Then we'll become more advanced in our spiritual life. That's what it means to be growing in spirit and maturity. God will not help us to advance ourselves without practicing ourselves. So think about this week until next Sunday, and we can share. We have a leadership meeting on Thursday, and we're going to share that anyway in that session. But on Sunday, after service, we can talk about it what you did during the weekdays.